Hey guys, we're here at the Texas Blockchain Summit with Natalie Brunel, Coin Stories of the Hard Money Show. Uh, she has been an advocate in the Bitcoin space for many years and comes to us as a moderator, a speaker, a thought leader. So we're grateful to have you all the way from California, just in Austin, Texas. Thanks so much for having me, Lee. Yeah. I'm really happy to be here. So w this is a crazy couple weeks. Um, we're sitting at kind of the, the trough of the bear market. What well, we hope is the trough. We don't know if it's the bottom or not. I don't think so yet. But. Yeah, we got some, <laughs> some crazy stuff happening. Genesis has just halted their uh, trading product, and they're the back end for a lot of these exchanges. Um, one of the things that has struck me is that, I don't know if you noticed this, I did not notice this before. All these CEOs of centralized exchanges were the people that were the faces of this industry in DC. Mm -hmm. And that's gotta change. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, who is the new, like who are the new thought leaders that can replace the Sam Bankman Freeds, the Brian Armstrongs, people like that? Well, you know, I have, I have an interesting answer for you because I think that Bitcoin is really money for the people. So I think that we need to get the working class, the regular folks out there in front of people in Washington who represent them to say, hey, we deserve a form of money that's not going to be inflated and won't be manipulated and can actually solve some of the problems in our current system. And I think that, you know, that's one of the great things about Bitcoin. We don't have a CEO. You know, I know that there are people out there spreading the word, including myself and really great, you know, thought leaders and authors that I look up to, but there's no face of Bitcoin. There's no CEO of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's not a company. And politicians, a lot of them still don't understand that. And so I think that the more that we present this as really a solution to the problems facing society and showcase the average working person and how they could benefit from a technology like this, a savings technology, something that you know not only allows them to transact value and you know not have the fees taken away from them by Visa or MasterCard in terms of a medium of exchange, but also as a store of value over the long term I get it it's volatile right now pushed down by all these you know exchanges that were cross collateralized with Bitcoin but I think we need to showcase that this is money for the people that's a great point and so that's something that I think resonates with the elected officials because jobs is a big deal um, we've done some studies that we're estimating about 2,000 direct jobs in the Bitcoin mining industry in Texas alone um, and 20,000 indirect jobs in the Bitcoin mining industry in Texas uh, so that's for rural communities. If you add a thousand jobs to a rural community, it changes the landscape mm -hmm. of the community. Um, Milam, so Bitcoin miners are the top employers in four Texas counties, 254 counties. So we've got a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. But I love what you said about for the people, um, the the average. I call them gray collar workers, not blue collar anymore, because it's kind of technical, right? If you're if you're working in this space, you so gray being a mix between blue and white, you might be like. Yeah heaving up a, uh, an ASIC that weighs 30 pounds, but then you're taking it apart and you're working on some very technical hash boards. Yeah. So there's a lot of complexity here, so that's why I call it gray market. So yeah. money for the people and, and really not having representatives. And so, so but, but there are people like Peter McCormick, like yourself, Anthony Pompliano, you have a platform. What is the, what is, like the last couple of weeks, what has been your message to the people that listen to your podcast and follow you on social media? Well, the message is, you know, always the same. It's really take the time to understand Bitcoin before you buy it. And when you do purchase it, we always recommend self-custody. And obviously the last couple of weeks have really highlighted that. So we always try to make the point about the difference between Bitcoin and crypto. And then now, even more so, where you buy your Bitcoin matters because if all of a sudden there's liquidity issues or solvency issues, you need to be able to take custody and protect your Bitcoin and know how to. And sometimes that's like a little bit of a hurdle and a learning process for people. So I think the last two weeks have, have highlighted the importance of, you know, why Bitcoin was invented. I know everyone has been talking about it on, on, the, on the news and on our podcast and on Twitter. And I hope that people use this as, as a learning opportunity to say, hey, why did this happen? Why did this happen? And how can I keep my money safe in the future if I do believe that Bitcoin could solve some of these problems and I do want to allocate part of my portfolio to it? Um, and just to comment on your earlier point, you know, we really need to invest in more CapEx and infrastructure here in this country. We, we need more energy, not less. Bitcoin is so tied to energy and I think it can um, also allow us to once again be a leader because I think our country is kind of going in the wrong direction when it comes to some of our energy issues. Um, so I hope Bitcoin can also help with that. You know, there are a lot of things that Bitcoin addresses. And so 
<laughs> this has been a crazy couple of weeks, but I think it also highlights you know how important Bitcoin is. Absolutely, and for the American project, right? The Constitution has uh, there's some some uh, echoes of our Constitution in the way that Bitcoin works. Mm -hmm. Property rights were the cornerstone of the Constitution, and uh, property rights are at the foundation of the Bitcoin blockchain. So when it comes to property rights, we have such a robust system here in the United States where the everyday person doesn't experience their, um, they have pretty decent protections in property rights. What have you seen maybe in the developing world where they don't have those similar property rights protections, where this kind of asset is revolutionary, mm -hmm. a, a digital piece of property rights that they, maybe they don't even secure in their physical property rights of their real property or their equities or whatever they're holding. Um, have you seen that play out in, like you're, you travel quite a bit in the developing world. What are some of the stories from from yeah. that world? Well, obviously we talk a lot about the problems that the U.S. has, but we, really come at this whole situation from such a point of privilege that we need to be conscious and aware of that, right? Because in so many places in the world, people still don't have access to bank accounts. People don't save, they live hand to mouth. People don't have access to energy. They don't have access to clean water. And so, um, you know, especially in the last year where we've seen wars break out in multiple places, we saw the Taliban take over Afghanistan. We saw, you know, R Russia and Ukraine start this massive conflict. And in both places, Bitcoin was used to help refugees escape, to help people to have people who couldn't get access to their bank accounts or their savings actually get out of the country and save their family. Wow, that's inspiring. People in developing countries in Africa right now, before Bitcoin, they were using as currency, I've been told multiple times, um, phone minutes. Phone minutes. And now they use Bitcoin. And it's revolutionizing, you know, societies, communities there, especially ones that are tapping into hydropower and building communities that are like mini Bitcoin cities. It's happening all over the world. Obviously, El Salvador is another example. I feel like it's been talked about in the news, but I think that it's really inspiring that in other countries that need access to the dollar via a stable coin, they also now can tap into Bitcoin and maybe hopefully start to save because in a lot of countries, again, for us, we've got like the 60-40 portfolio. Everyone knows we're supposed to save for a rainy day. That's not that's that's not the case for people in a lot of different countries. But you know, hopefully, if we do believe that it's going to go up over time, people that are transacting and using Bitcoin and storing a little bit of it all over the world, they're going to have savings for the future, which I, I think is amazing and it's inspiring. And um, you know, I'm a big proponent of the American dream, and I think Bitcoin not only offers us a renaissance of the American dream here, but also creates an El Salvador dream, a Nigerian dream, an Indian dream. Anyone who has access to it and wants to contribute in the space can, no matter where they are, with access to the internet. So you mentioned stable coins. Let me talk about geopolitics for just a second. A lot of the elected officials that we work with are very concerned about the status of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Do you think that stable coins, especially ones like USDC and others, leave Tether aside for a moment, have the potential with dollars being locked up in these contracts, had the potential to uh, benefit the dollar's hegemony as the world reserve currency or um, bring it down? Yeah, I think that the future will have a digital dollar in the form of a stable coin that is accessible to people all over the world. And I think we just need transparency with the reserve so that, you know, so that there's actually a peg that remains stable. Um, we've seen, you know, algorithmic stable coins blow up in this past year and a lot of people are questioning the reserves of pretty much any centralized entity in the space. Um, but I don't think that the U.S. has to be worried about the dollar's position anytime soon. I mean, it's still used for 80% of transactions globally. But at the same time, the U.S. has also really, I think, taken advantage of its position by printing so much money and taking us so far into debt, right? Because now you're essentially causing, um, you're, you're creating a catalyst for why these other countries are building a system like BRICS. They're de-dollarizing because they don't trust in our money anymore. They don't trust in the treasuries because we keep just printing money. So I think that or for you know, geopolitical reasons, for sure. But they don't trust us for sure. But leaders, I think, have to be more cognizant of what they're doing in terms of their monetary and fiscal policy, and and rein it in a little bit, and think of think of what is going to make 
American workers strong again and American wages as strong as possible so that we are competitive. And, I, and we used to be, right? We used to be the world's largest creditor nation. Now we're the world's largest debtor nation. We've shipped off all manufacturing overseas. And I get that part of that was being the global reserve currency and squashing the dollar, you know, and allowing um, imports to basically increase. But at the end of the day, how, how well has that served the middle class? We've basically decimated it. So what's going to make the middle class strong again? And that's why I'm actually really bullish that the U.S. will get Bitcoin right. That regulators, that policymakers will say, you know what, this could give us a real competitive advantage, not only for jobs and different industries, but like to put it on our balance sheet. You know, I mean, I know that some people think I'm crazy to say that, but I really do believe that eventually the U.S. will have Bitcoin. They've already confiscated a lot via different civil forfeitures, so who knows how many we actually have. But we have smart people. I, we ha I mean, I don't believe that everyone that we have um, running the country is either completely ignorant or, or, um, or running with, you know, malice. I think that there are good people who want to make the country better, and I think that they need to learn about Bitcoin because it does address some of these problems at the core. Well, Natalie, you're very gracious to give us some of your time for a conversation. I know you've got a lot going on this week. In fact, an interview with uh, Nick Carter on stage mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, just one question about that. You know, I've, I've been a very big fan of Nick's analysis recently. He's got a great piece about proof of reserves, proof of liabilities, dynamic, real time. Like, there's a lot of ways to slice that onion, and it, we need to make sure that we're talking about the nuance there. What, what are you, give us a little bit about what you plan on asking him about. I know you're gonna talk about White House stuff, Bitcoin mining, but also yeah. I'm sure this stuff will come up because of what's happened in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I mean, he's done some great pieces uh, about specifically that, and he was calling out some of the concerns about this industry before. Um, so I do want to ask him about proof of reserves and how we move to a place where people actually feel comfortable trusting an exchange where they purchase their Bitcoin. I always recommend, though, self-custody. I get that it's, it's intimidating for some people. I was intimidated when I first started, and I wanted to trust a third party because I thought, well, I trust my bank, right? I trust my bank with my checking and savings account, but really in this space, the whole idea is sovereignty, and Nick writes about that as well. Um, but I also want to talk to him about his White House climate report, because um, he made some fantastic commentary. I actually read his full article out loud, just to have for people to have like an audio version of it, because I just thought it had a lot of great information in it, and it showed- I hope he quoted, um, did he quote me in there? I hope yes, he did. He did. Okay, good. Yeah, you were in there, you were in there. And- uh, I gave him some info yes, for that. I was like, at least give me did. a little credit Yeah, here. I think it was in the part about Texas, actually, in the West Texas. And, and the grid, you know, it's really important because unfortunately, if the White House is going to put out a report like that, it has to have scientific, factual information and talk to people in the industry, which clearly they talked to random people that, you know, shouldn't have even been in some of these journals because it wasn't peer reviewed and it wasn't scientific. And I mean, one of the main sources was this Dutch central banker who has a blog. That's not okay. The White House needs to do better. And Nick is one of the people calling them out in a very cheerful, constructive way, which I believe in. Like, we should be nice about it. Right. We should be nice at first, at least, right? We should be nice at first and be like, hey, you got this wrong. Can we help you? And then if they keep being, you know, if they keep having the door shut, then maybe we need to, like, pound on it harder. But I always start with the, you know, more, you attract more bees with honey or what do you, what is it? You attract more flies. <laughs> yes, that's a great <laughs> phrase. And I use that in a, in a Twitter spaces discussion that Christopher actually, who's walking by right now, put on. Oh. I was in an argument with Jimmy Song, uh, who I respect the heck out of, <laughs> and I used that exact phrase, and he's like, nah. <laughs> he's like, well, let's just be harsh. <laughs> well, and, and some people do have that attitude. I, I, I we, need, we need it all, though. Yeah, we do, we do. I, um, I really wish that we could come together more. I do, and it, and it starts with a conversation. Like. One thing that I said on a show recently is I truly think that one of the most American things that everyone can do, especially c with the holidays coming up, is just find someone that you disagree with and just have a conversation with them. You know, we're all people. Most of us are very similar. Most of us have more in common than we do, than we do have things kind of completely on the opposite sides of the spectrum. Just have a conversation. Why does the person feel the way that they do? Um, and I, I love that Bitcoin kind of inspires me to think that the world can be better if the incentive system changes, if the incentive structures change, if there are, you know, if there are systems that aren't so manipulated and where you feel like you actually have more economic opportunity and empowerment. That's a great sentiment to end on. Thanks for being with us and uh, we look forward to your talk tomorrow. Thanks for having me.
I'm Lee Bratcher, the president of the Texas Blockchain Council. Thank you to everyone who came out to this year's summit, helping us make it the best one yet. Now more than ever, we need professional industry associations like the TBC to help craft effective policy instead of the CEOs of centralized exchanges roaming the halls of various state capitals or in DC. Texas is quickly becoming the center of the universe for Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital assets. If you want to be part of the future that we are crafting here in Texas, join the TBC today.